welcome to Collider Movie Talk, Movie Talk for Movie Fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is the daily show where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is John Campion. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Hollywood Burbank Studios of Collider <laughs> Video, and we're so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here is John Schnepp. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm on Team Storks, yo. What's going on? <laughs> Storks, baby. And Mark Ellis. I'm freezing in the studio right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. We had a little bit of shift in the weather the last couple months, and it felt great, and now my nipples are too hard. <laughs> we were right under the air conditioner. Find a nickel yeah. for every time you said that. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of money around here. Hey, listen, guys, as you see in our sidebar here, we've got a whole list of stories to go through. But as happens, a couple of stories broke late that we didn't have time to get in the sidebar. And one of them just came through the wire about a half hour ago. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal, uh, DC executive Jeff Johns has confirmed what a lot of us were speculating for a very long time now. Actor Joe Manganiello, Manganiello, is officially, it's done, it's signed, it's official. He is Deathstroke in the upcoming Batman standalone film being directed by Ben Affleck. Now, a lot of people were speculating, hey, maybe we're going to see Deathstroke in Justice League. And hey, that's still, I mean, he didn't come out and say he's not appearing in Justice League, but I, I doubt he will be. But it's a done deal. Joe is Deathstroke. So, Schnepp, really there are two questions here. Number one, how do you feel about Deathstroke being the villain in the standalone Batman film? Question number two, Joe Manganiello, do you think this was a good choice? I think both are yes. I think Joe Manganiello is a good choice. We were like discussing how to say his name earlier. I think we are positively... That's we're we're on the right. right now. It is Manganello, Manganello baby. We were in the G before. Yeah. We, we, <laughs> we were. We, we were manging it. Yeah, Manganello. I'm not kidding. I, I, just, I interviewed Joe, and I sat across from him, and I several times referred to him as Joe Manganello. And he, he was very... Now I know how kind he is because he never <laughs> embarrassed me by correcting me. He just let me roll with it. Joe, I apologize. And <laughs> I always think of that guy who plays a... That's Joe something something, but that's not really his name. Wow, I gotta look <laughs> the, that up. Now. The infamous <laughs> jazz era. Yeah, the guy Joe with, something Joe something. Scream being a lonely man. Yeah, anyway, yeah, I think it's great. I love him as Deathstroke. Oh. I hope he's. I hope they do have a little quick shot of him in Just League. And Affleck was just kind of like giving us a little tease. That's probably not the shot, or maybe that is the shot. But uh, I'm happy to see him as the lead villain of Batman. But I still think Batman, the Ben Affleck one, is gonna. The, some of it's gonna take place in Arkham Asylum, and we are gonna get to see the new DCEU's versions of Batman's rogues gallery. I think that's a perfect way to do it. Hopefully the Joker's in there somewhere, but I like seeing Deathstroke being the main character. Yeah, Mark, I, you heard I, about this? I love knowing that Joe Manganiello, man, I read that wrong, Manganiello, <laughs> is going to be Deathstroke because he is the guy who adds, obviously, a lot of toughness. He's a badass, but he also has some charisma. He's got some personality and roles that we've seen on screen from him. And so having him as Deathstroke, I believe what John Schnapp is saying, or John Schnapp, is that <laughs> it's not going to be potentially the main Batman villain going forward, but at least in this first film, he's going to take up a good chunk of time, a la what Scarecrow was yeah. in Batman Begins. When you think mm. back to the Nolan trilogy of Batman movies, Scarecrow isn't the first villain that comes to mind because we obviously think about Heath Ledger's Joker and maybe Bane before Scarecrow, but Scarecrow helped set up that universe, and I think that's what Deathstroke is going to do to be a good foil for Batman kicking things off. I Okay, first of all, I think Deathstroke is the perfect Batman villain. I mean, if we if it wasn't for the fact that we already have the KG Beast, I right. would have maybe said the KG <laughs> Beast, but think about it. Now, we've had Ben Affleck's Batman fight the hero of heroes. He's fought fought Superman. I love the idea of kicking off his standalone film series with another just human badass. Mm -hmm. One of the guys in the DC Universe who can go toe-to-toe with Batman. Somebody is lethal and dangerous and whatever. And that dude is Deathstroke. Totally. And I think this was just a great choice. So I do think he's going to be the main villain. I think he's going to be the main guy that he faces. And I might even think he doesn't die at the end of that one because I think they may want to use him because he's such a good character. They may want to use him beyond that first movie. Well, he's he's got to tie in with the Titans and Cyborg (laughs) because that's how he was originally, uh, you know, introduced Slade is a you know uh, we've seen a lot of characters from no, comics true. books not used the way they but were in the, the books. When, uh, Mark Elias or El- 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 Elias Elias uh, Mark Elias. he mentioned like uh, Scarecrow. Remember there was also Ross. He was the main villain and he kind of went through all of the movies. Ross Al Ghul. 
So he was like the main. Right. So did Scarecrow yeah. too. I mean, Scarecrow would pop up from time to totally. time in the other ones, and so I think and you could there. utilize yep. him in the same way. Imagine if Deathstroke is in Justice League for a minute, survives Justice League, and then survives the first Batman standalone movie. I think we'll see a little glimpse of him in Justice League, or his character might be hinted at. But obviously, he's not going to be that big of a part of that movie. They have bigger fish to fry. Batman versus Deathstroke, that first standalone Batman film, that's pretty exciting. That is going to be, and I hope they have several fights throughout the film. And here's the thing too, with a guy like Joe Manganiello. Hello. This is a great example where when we first got glimpses, it's probably going to be Deathstroke. A lot of people threw out a lot of great names as to who could play him. This is, And not a lot of people said Joe Manganiello until his name surfaced online. Right. This is a great example of sometimes we can, there are lots of different actors who can play lots of different roles. And when a name like Joe's comes out of nowhere and we all go, yeah, obviously, this is a great example that, you know, there are many good actors you can get for different roles. Joe is one of those guys. I'm excited that he's going to play this. Now, but I want to ask you, Sinead, like you're familiar with Joe and, and some of his films. Magic what do you Mike? think about <laughs> what do you think about him appearing in the new Batman film? Um, I love it. And I was just talking to my little brother about this whole uh, Deathstroke thing. And he was like, this has to be the villain. And he was like showing me all of the backstory of this. I think this is great. And Joe Manganiello just has that like, Oh man, he's got something about him that's very powerful and he has such a presence that I feel like a villain role is great for him, but Deathstroke is like this is spot on casting. Maybe like he's it. not playing yeah. Deathstroke, maybe he's playing a like stripper Deathstroke. Like, yeah. like you know, I'd stripper cops that show up like, hey, has anybody seen Batman here? Right. Oomsh, oomsh. Heatstroke. I, His heat name is Heatstroke. Heatstroke. <laughs> he's no, getting I, naked. Hey, look, I know it's 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 not it's not manly for a guy to talk about Magic Mike. He's really good in the Magic oh, yeah. Mike Fels. He's funny. He's, he's got charisma. I think he's going to bring a lot to he the He was show. also really up for Batman. Remember we were talking about who's going to play Batman right. before right. Affleck nailed it, became Batfleck. His name popped up a yeah. lot of times. Mangfleck. And, yeah, and I'm glad that your brother's such a sweaty. Yeah, he is. <laughs> All right, well, another story that kind of broke late last night, and, you know, this is going to be something, if those of you who are like me kind of grew up watching the world of wrestling, this is really fascinating. Some of you might remember the story of Chris Benoit. Some people consider him one of the greatest professional wrestlers of all time. And I believe it was in 2007, the professional wrestling world was shocked when Chris Benoit was found out. He was found, he had uh, murdered his wife and his child and then committed suicide, which shocked everybody in the wrestling world because they were like, Chris Benoit is like one of the nicest guys anybody he had ever met. And then it, later on, it turned out that, I mean, and right away, the WWE pulled all history of Chris Benoit off their websites. They wouldn't acknowledge him. And, and understandably so. I mean, this was a horrible, horrible event. What happened then later on was during the autopsy, they found out when they looked at his brain that he had suffered so many concussions and had so much head trauma. I remember the, uh, the, the doctor in charge of the autopsy said he literally had the brain of an 85-year-old Alzheimer's patient. And that's terrible, and then that's horrible. And so a lot of people still talk about Chris Benoit with very touchy things. Now, there a couple of years ago, there were some words coming out that there might be a movie based on the life and death of Chris Benoit. It was going to be called Crossface, uh, which is a reference to one of his finishing moves that Chris Benoit often used. That kind of came and went. Different writers and directors became attached to it. But yesterday... Punisher Warzone director Lexi Alexander, who we like very much around here, she's done some directing on television as well, she confirmed on her Twitter last night that she is now on board to direct a crossface movie based on the life of Chris Benoit, and she said the script is really great, there's a finished script, she said she fell in love with the script, she wasn't going to direct feature films anymore, but the script was so good she wanted to come back and do it. Anyway, Mark, you heard this story. Is it, I mean, it's a very touchy subject, you're talking about a guy who double murder and suicide, but then you find out there's some medical situations involved. Do you think this is a movie they should do? And if so, how do you feel about Lexi Alexander directing it? Oh, absolutely. I think it's an important movie that should be done, which is why Lexi Alexander is the perfect choice, because she is a phenomenal social media presence. She talks about a lot of controversial, a lot of important issues online. And so having her approach this with the passion, because Lexi also is a very you know physical stunt performer herself. I think she understands oh, yeah. more of this world than most directors would. And coming from a guy who's not never been a wrestling fan, but I'm a huge NFL fan. So when 
when you saw the parallels between yes. what the brain study of Chris Benoit's autopsy showed versus what we're learning about CTE in retired NFL players, some of whom, like Junior Seau, have been through the same sad, tragic career path that Chris Benoit had been. This is an important message that needs to get out. So I think Lexi Alexander is the right person to tackle this directing the movie. Schnepp, what do you think about this whole story? Yeah, for sure. If you follow Lexi on Twitter or any of her social media, you know she's like a hot button pusher. She's and usually almost 90% of the time she's right. And if she's arguing with someone online and you like follow that feed backwards, you'd be like, oh man, she's just nailing this person. Cause she's not afraid to, to say, speak her mind. And I think having someone very, a very strong uh, vocal person uh, directing this film, that's what you need with a film like this. You need to not be afraid to go into the you know, the darker side of this story, which is a very dark side, you know? It was one of the interesting things too, now my timing might be wrong here. If pe guys watching live, correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, but I believe it was shortly after the revelations of Chris Benoit's, his metal, uh, mental condition because of the brain damage that he had suffered, WWE shortly thereafter changed some of their rules. Because you remember in wrestling, it always used to be a guy come into the ring with a chair and bang the other guy mm -hmm. over the head. They not, that doesn't happen in wrestling anymore. Now, they, whenever guys come with the chairs, they hit them over the back all the time. So they're trying to reduce that type of stuff. I'm going to be fascinated, A, to see if this goes all the way to production, and then B, what kind of approach they take to this story. Because it, no matter how you look at it, it's absolutely tragic. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get on with our first official story of the day. Greg Berlanti, the producer behind the CW series The Flash and Arrow, is currently developing a feature adaptation of the DC comic Booster Gold. In an interview with Vulture, Berlanti revealed that the Booster Gold movie is not currently being envisioned as part of the DC Extended Universe. As of right now, we have no connective tissue to those worlds. It'd be a separate thing. John, what do you think about a Booster Gold movie not being set in the DCEU? I'm so torn because part <laughs> of me is like, like, if you guys have been watching me for any period of time, you know I'm like, I long, like I love, love the shared universe stuff too, but I also long for standalone superhero movies mm -hmm. where a superhero is unique in their universe and all that kind of stuff, right? So I get excited about that. I don't know that Booster Gold is the one to do that with though, because when you look at Booster Gold, you understand he's a dude from the future, he comes back in time utilizing his technology and knowledge of history to make himself heroic and be a superstar. A lot of people online mentioning Nathan Fillion as a good guy for that character. I think Nathan might be a little bit old for that role, but he, I would line up to see it. But when you understand Booster Gold, is he the type of character you have in a standalone universe? Isn't Doesn't the whole nature of Booster Gold kind of suggest a larger universe of heroes and things like mm -hmm. that? So I'll be honest with you, I'm not quite sure how to take this. Part of me is pessimistic, part of me is excited. Schnepp, you hear this, what's your reaction to it? My reaction is I plead to you, Greg Berlanti, if you're making this film and you're directing this film and it's gonna be a feature film, Make it part of the CW universe that you've launched so successfully. Mm. If you're going to make a mockumentary, like make a, do it's going to be like a handheld kind of first person booster gold documentary. I would use all of the CW characters that you've already envisioned that have that lighthearted edge to it. That's what I would hope that the booster gold movie is going to be. Mark? I think this is a great idea to do a standalone movie because the DCU, it just takes itself so seriously and it's such True. a realistic, gritty universe that having somebody run around like this, it just doesn't jive with it. And there's only so many superheroes you can cram into one universe. I'd be more on board with Schnapp's idea. I'm not a huge fan of the CW show, so I'm not sure how a hardcore fanatic of those would treat having Booster Gold wedged into that universe as well. I think that's a better idea than putting them in the movie universe. And I kind of like this precedent that it would set that we can have superheroes that come from a DC comic or a Marvel comic, they don't necessarily have to all fit in the same universe. It works pretty well so far with X-Men being in their own thing and then having all the other Marvel superheroes being in their own thing. I like this idea, and I think it'd be a fun enough movie on a standalone, especially if you get a star like a Nathan Fillion or somebody else to fill the suit of Booster Gold. To I think it, it would get a big enough audience that you could get it on your own and not have to tie it in to anything else going on in the DCEU. You bring up a very interesting point because, remember, we heard reports about the possibility of a Booster Gold movie a while ago, but it wasn't just Booster Gold. The reports we had heard before was a buddy movie of Booster Gold and Blue Beetle. So if Berlanti, let's assume for a second, granted we're just making an assumption here, but let's assume for a second that Blue Beetle is still connected to this project, okay? Could Warner Brothers and Berlanti, could they be setting up a second hero cinematic universe where you've got guys like Booster Gold, Blue Beetle, maybe some other DC characters that would never be used in this Zack Snyder DC universe. Right. 
could we be seeing the origin of two cinematic universes it's, at Warner Brothers? It's not a bad idea because remember, Blue Beetle comes from the Charlton characters, which was also right. the question. A whole bunch of different characters that the DC then absorbed, but before they absorbed them, Alan Moore was writing this big epic story involving the question and Blue Beetle, and that ended up turning into Watchmen when they were like, no, 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 we're going to absorb the Charlton characters. <laughs> into our universe, that's why we had Rorschach and Night Owl. So, right. I mean, there's a whole bunch of like weird history that goes along with this, but I wouldn't mind seeing Blue Beetle or even a lot of the more humorous characters from the Justice League run. I mean, remember Booster Gold was introduced, I think he was introduced in a Superman uh, comic book. I think, I think he was. Uh, Dan Jurgens did it, yeah. So, uh, you know, he's supposed to be like a, uh, a characterization of like, you know, kind of a jerk. Like, you know, look, I'm using my futuristic powers to sell cars and like, I'm, you know, it's an ultimate like, you know, I'm gonna make money off this and become a superstar, a celebrity. And that's what's so great about, you know, making a, a mockumentary or, or something like a, something that's outside of the re regular realm of the DC world so we can look at reality television through the lens of a superhero. Do you guys remember Booster Gold in Smallville? No. Yeah, but they had Booster Gold in Smallville. They had Booster Gold pop up in Smallville. And while I'm not saying you make that Booster Gold in the movie, I'm not saying that, but they everything you were just describing, they totally nailed that oh, wow. with what they were doing in, um, in the Smallville character as well. So it'll be interesting to see where they go from there. All right, what's next? James Cameron has revealed new details about Avatar 2 and the other Avatar sequels. In a new interview with Variety, Cameron said that the sequels will actually be a family saga. The storyline in the sequels really follows Jake and Natiri and their children. It's more of a family saga about the struggle with the humans. And though Avatar 2 still holds a release date of Christmas 2018, Cameron also said that he will move it if need be. We haven't moved that target yet, but we will if we need to. The important thing for me is not when the first one comes out, but the cadence of the release pattern. I want them to be, to be released as close together as possible. If it's an annual appointment to show up at Christmas, I want to make sure that we're able to fulfill on that promise. Mark, what do you think about the story details revealed by James Cameron? Let's do the family saga then, man. It's just, <laughs> we'll have another one where we get the first couple of movies with the parents that we know and love already, and then their kids are going to take over. Then we can get three more Avatar movies. It makes sense. That's what happens in movies is when somebody does something heroic or daring and they go to the other side, you're going to procreate. They're going to make lots of babies together. Then we're going to have to protect those babies against the evil humans who you know are coming up with another scheme to take over Pandora. That's what I would expect this to be because it's not just going to be a happy family saga. This is going to be them like, you know, going to work and coming home and going to baseball <laughs> games on the weekends. There's going to be issues on Pandora and we got to stop it as a family. Schnapp. Now, didn't Stephen Lang die in the first Avatar movie? I believe he did, guy. yes. So and he's returning. And he is returning. So I hope there's like a whole ship full of Stephen Langs. Like he's just like <laughs> an angry cloned army of Stephen Langs. And so he's blind? What, well, no, we're not. Oh, we're not going. Okay. Don't breathe. We're just. Uh, he's got some scars on his face, like in the original uh, Avatar. I love the idea of pushing. I, I'm guessing that what James Cameron is doing is prepping us that Avatar, the second one, is going to be pushed to 2019 because what he's saying is he wants an annual release of all four films. And if you look at the release of the last two, it's 2020. Two and 2023, and then there's like a, a two-year wait in between 18, and then the other one's like 2020. So, I would guess that he's going to push the first one to 2019, so that we get 19, 20, 21, and 22. So I would, I would hope so. And I'm glad he's taking his time with this entire universe. It's very important to him. He's a great writer, director. I could wait five more years if I have to in order to get four incredible films from him. I, I still struggle with this a little bit. First of all, on the whole family thing, I like it. It's, it's a neat idea. They are doing some interesting things with it because, like you mentioned before, they're bringing back Stephen Lang's character, who I thought was gone. They're bringing back Sigourney Weaver, who I thought was gone. Mm -hmm. They tried to save her, but she got absorbed into the tree. Yeah, yeah that's right. Like she tree got absorbed into the tree. Tree Weaver thing. is a scary tree Weaver. To tree deal. Weaver. Yeah. I can't yeah. think. So, you know As song. of right now, I believe the release schedule is uh, 2018, 2020, 2022, and then one year later at 2023. I think that's their, their plan right now, yeah. so to speak. I, I still think. I know we got to get past this, but I still kind of feel like they waited too long to get this Avatar thing going because while Avatar is like the biggest box office film of all time, it has not maintained any pop cultural relevance. Like the first Halloween and maybe the second Halloween, I saw some of the big blue costumes and Halloweens. I don't see anybody anywhere dressing like you still see Heath Ledger's Joker everywhere you go. You still see Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles everywhere you go. 
but you don't see people dressed up as anything from Avatar. I just wonder if they're getting to this a little bit too late. But if they're going to do it, go big. Go four and make it a family drama. Sounds good to me. I mean, look, once you have babies, allegedly, you start being more protective of your world. So, like, it's it, like, like the Navi weren't True. already protective and wanting to stop the humans. Now that, that Sam Worthington's guy is going to have some kids that you got to protect, right. it's all bets are off now. Look out, Tree Weaver. That's a lot of <laughs> commitment, too, to cosplay as a Navi. You got to be getting it totally is. naked and all blue with a lot of weird paint dots all over you. So, I think they're going to re release. The original Avatar with like some ex, you know expanded oh, better absolutely. 3D mm-hmm. maybe and they'll do that in 2019 just to to wet the wheels and be like hey we're going back to this world with four more movies. Does so. anybody like Sinead, Mark, anybody have any doubt they're going to re-release the original Avatar? No. Whether like within the year of the the next one coming out, w- within a year of the next one coming out, yeah, you gotta you gotta get people's appetite wet again. You know, they could just like do what a lot of video games do and like, hey, we reskinned the entire movie so it's the ultra 3D. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, they're like, hey, it's not 2K, it's 4K. They're like, this is super 3D, yo. I don't know. They're going to do it. All right, guys, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Sinead's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down, and those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Sinead, what do we got? According to a report from THR, Reese Witherspoon and Minnie Kaling are in negotiations to star in A Wrinkle in Time, Ava DuVernay and Disney's adaptation of the children's book. The story centers on a young girl who finds herself on an interplanetary journey to locate her missing father, aided by a trio of supernatural beings, Mrs. What's-It, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Witch. A November start in Los Angeles is scheduled. Schnepp, do you buy or sell the addition of Reese Witherspoon and Mindy Kaling to, to A Wrinkle in Time? Yeah, to, you know, play against Oprah Winfrey, I think that's a a great trio I think uh, you know I haven't read the book I know it's a lot of people's favorite books I know Holly loves the book so I think having a great director and then these three stars Reese Witherspoon has been in so many great films I loved her in the wild which was a great film uh, and she just did that great one with Joe Manganiello's wife no, uh, hot no, pursuit. no. Oh, I know that was yeah. one of your top favorites oh, of the year. Oh my god! Up for an Oscar last I year. I totally yes. forgot about that <laughs> yeah. movie. I faked having a bathroom necessity to get mm. out of that movie, and I just never returned. What's the Aquaman version of that? Hot pursuit. It's called what? Something Larry. Something. <laughs> Something. It's called Spicy Larry. Spicy, Spicy Larry. Larry. Yeah, that's right. Well, we forgive you, Reese, for that one. I say. <laughs> Mark, what do you think about this? Buy or sell? Yeah, man. I mean, look, anything with Oprah in it that's based on a book is like gold. That is like, that's platinum right there. Then you add Reese Witherspoon <laughs> and Mindy Kaling. Mindy Kaling is the addition that really gets me excited, though, because she's so funny in the Mindy Project, and she was great when she voiced Disgust in Inside Out. Yeah. So I think that her addition lends a comedic element that I would want to see in A Wrinkle in Time. So this movie's making all the right plays so far. I might have read that book. Well, you know, for me, it's it's a buy. This yeah. has got to be a buy for several reasons. Number one, the story sounds great. I think this sounds like it could be really whimsical and really charming. But on top of that, it's not this pair. It's this trio. Reese Witherspoon, Kaling, and Oprah Winfrey together. I can see it. And I mm-hmm. think their their interactions are going to be fun and funny at the same time. Uh, it's the character Mrs. Who, I don't know if that's the doctor's wife, but then wouldn't that <laughs> shared universe? <laughs> Mrs. Who is the doctor's wife, shared universe. Yeah, so for me, it's a buy. All right, what's next? In a report from The Wrap, Relativity's long in development The Crow remake will begin production this January. The film will star Aquaman's Jason Momoa, which will have Colin Hardy in the director chair. The story follows Eric Draven, a murder victim who returns from the dead, seeking vengeance on those who murdered him and his fiancée with the help of a mystical bird. A release date has yet to be targeted. John, after so many starts and stops, do you buy or sell this Crow remake finally starting production in January? Look, I hope this is real. I hope they can get it going. I think they have a good group of people. Then again, I thought they had good groups of people before over the last couple of years. But until I see a still of them on set <laughs> with a camera rolling, I got to sell it. I'm sorry. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me 18 times, shame on me. This thing has like new star 15 times, new director 15 times. We're going to be shooting at this date, comes and goes. But now we're shooting. Okay, look, I hope it's true. I hope it's real. I want it to happen and I want it to be good. But until until it starts shooting, I'm sorry, the track record is not so good, so I'm going to sell it. Mark. You know, I've come full circle on our talking about the Crow stories here on Movie Talk <laughs> because I used to be really upset that we had to keep talking about another Crow production that may or may not happen, but it brings me back to the earliest days of AMC Movie Talk. I was just some plucky kid fresh out of high school, <laughs> and we got to talk about stuff like the Crow, and I was excited about it. Then we kept talking and talking and talking about it, and now I'm all the way back to where I buy this. This is going to happen. Jason Momoa is the right guy to be the Crow. Production starts this January. Woohoo. You need an extra? Call me. 
That's right. Schnepp. I'm buying this too. I'm very excited that they got Jason Momoa and things just just fell into place. Colin Hardy is a very committed director to this property. I like his vision of it. I've read a lot about a thing, a lot of different things that he said about this. He's committed to taking what James O'Barr, his original James O'Barr's original Crow comic, which is way darker than the Alex Proyas film. Now Alex Proyas's film is a masterpiece. I Classic. think it's it's a great film. It's Brandon Lee like just showcasing him and the great actor that he was. A lot of a lot of films have borrowed from The Crow. So many films that you can't even name them all because but this is 20 years later. I think The Crow deserves a new rebirth, a, a reimagining and in fact like a more loyal and more uh, you know a right right from the comic in, onto the screen. I think that's what they're going to do. So I'm excited to see What this. kind of soundtrack do you all think we're going to get with this new Crow that's definitely going to happen metal. starting in January? Metal. Think it's going to be hardcore metal? It's going to be hardcore metal. Cuz it was like very 90s metally grunge kind of stuff originally. No. Do you bring back that or do you go for like no. a new metal? It's going to be a mixture of Public Enemy and Vanilla Ice. Yeah. Yeah. The whole thing, it's a new vision, <laughs> totally new vision. Look, but keep this in mind too, guys. I'm excited about Momo on this, but some other names that have been attached and have then gone away. James McAvoy, uh, you've got Tom Hiddleston, Jack Houston recently was Bradley on Cooper. there. Bradley Cooper, yeah. Luke Evans, who I thought would have been, actually I think Luke Evans probably would have been a really good girl. I think most of I just, Need to see it actually happening before I can get on board. You see that slate? We're shooting the crow. Yes, they're shooting in Los Angeles. Invite us to the set visit. But it's, 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 it's got to pass the Aquaman test for me now because all those guys that you just listed are great actors, and I love seeing them in movies. But you give me any one of those names cast as Aquaman, I'm still like, uh, he's still Aquaman. Jason Momoa, when he was cast as Aquaman, I'm like, I totally love Aquaman. Right. Now. Momoa yeah. is that kind of presence on screen. They can bring life to Aquaman and certainly to the crow. All right, what's next? Screen Daily was the first to report that Johnny Depp is in talks to star in the crime thriller Labyrinth, with Lincoln lawyer director Brad Furman on board to helm. Depp will play Russell Poole, the Los Angeles police detective who investigated the murders of rappers Notorious B.I.G. and Tupac Shakur. No release date has been set. Mark, do you buy or sell Johnny Depp as Detective Poole in Labyrinth? I don't know much about the Detective Poole angle of the Biggie Tupac thing when it went down, but him investigating it for a while. So Johnny Depp, very committed to whatever role he wants. So it's going to be a buy for me based on the fact that there's Johnny Depp and he's not putting on some crazy wig or a lot of makeup to play this role. He gets to be a little more grounded in a story that takes place in reality. Schnepp. Yeah, I'm going to buy it as long as he's in the same realm as what Mark was just talking about. I want to see Johnny Depp return to character acting. Um, he did a great job last year in Black Mass. I thought, you know, a lot of people said that was too character-y, but I didn't think so. I thought it was great. I'd like to see him return to something like this. Uh, the actual story between behind Poole and the LAPD is, is very controversial. I'd like to see the angle that they're going to go with. I'm hesitantly... Buy. Okay, I'm going to buy it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I thought Johnny Depp was great in Black Mass. I thought, you know, while the movie didn't end up like completely wowing me the, the way I wanted to, the performance he gave, I thought he showed and reminded people, hey, he's not just some put on a wild wig and sure. be goofy kind of an actor. He can be great. And this is the type of story and type of movie that could give him an opportunity to really show off those chops that maybe he hasn't given himself the opportunity in a number of his projects that he's chosen to be in in the past 10 years or so. This could be one of them. If they do it though, I wanna make sure that they go into the investigation. Make this thing a mystery. Don't just be glam glam with with you know the big names on this. Make it a legit mystery. Make him go into the corruption of the police and all that kind of stuff and what got him in trouble with it, what caused his early retirement. If they go in that direction with Johnny Depp being in it, this could be really, really special. So I'm gonna give it a buy. All right, what's next? The first trailer for Collateral Beauty, starring Will Smith and Helen Mirren, has been released. Directed by The Devil Wears Prada's David Frankel, the movie features Smith as an ad man who's struggling with the death of his daughter. While friends worry about his emotional state, he writes letters to death, love, and time, who then respond. The film opens on December 16th. Schnepp, do you buy or sell the first trailer for Collateral Beauty? I'm so somewhere in the middle with this. I watched <laughs> the trailer and I was like, I was having a hard time discerning whether or not uh, these characters of love, death, and time were real, or were they were they hired by his other ad friends to like haunt him and follow him around? It was like, like the Michael Douglas is the game. Yeah, I mean, I really, honestly, I was like, if it's the latter, I like it. If it's the former, I don't know if I want to see it because I don't really want to see like it, you know, it's a wonderful life. I've already seen that movie, and also playing with somebody's uh, real emotions of the loss of his daughter. I don't need to see like fake fairy tale people come in and be telling you it's all right. Life's hard enough, so hopefully it's the latter, and they're like hiring some actors to help push this guy out of the hole that he's dug himself. 
Mark? I buy Helen Mirren as the best Grim Reaper we've seen on screen since Bill and Ted's bogus journey, ladies and gentlemen. I'm with Schnepp. I have no idea how to feel about this movie. I'm going to buy it because I love Will Smith so near and dear to my heart. He's so charismatic. He's such a great actor when he commits to stuff like this. I did think Oscar bait. When I'm watching this, I'm like, this is everybody in this movie is gunning for an Oscar of some point because it's going to be one of those stories that tugs on your emotions and pulls on the heartstrings. I just have to buy it because I think there's too much potential here. This could be the worst movie of the year, but I think it's going to be good enough to make me want to go see it this Christmas. I'm going to go so far into the buy on this. I thought this trailer was magnificent on every level. First of all, the confusion you're having, I think is part of the brilliance of it because we see this trailer, it's like, do we, we don't really know what's going on right. here. We're getting a sense of it, but we don't actually know what's happening. If these are the three quote unquote real characters of death, time and love, that's amazing. If they are people, if it's some kind of elaborate coordinated effort by friends, I also find that very fascinating. But Smith looks incredible. Look, I'll go on record right now. There was a little bit of controversy that Smith didn't get an Academy Award nomination for Concussion mm -hmm. last year. I didn't think he deserved a nomination. I thought he was very, very good in it, but I didn't think he deserved a nomination. Holy crap, it looks like he's coming back with a mm -hmm. vengeance in this, because if his whole movie delivers the level of performance that I saw him give in this trailer, and granted it's just a small frame, right. it's just a trailer, but it does have Oscar bait, and Oscar bait is not necessarily a bad term. I thought this was imaginative. I thought just the trailer itself had my heartstrings being pulled. I found myself engaging, and it's just a freaking two and a half minute trailer. This is one of the best trailers I've seen this year. So I'm gonna go way far onto that end. For me, it's a massive buy. All right, folks. It has come to that part of the show now for opening this week. Since it is Thursday, that means it is time for us to talk about all the new movies that are going to be coming out in theaters this coming weekend, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. We've got four significant films opening this week. So, Sinead, what are they? All right, first up is Sully. Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger, played by Tom Hanks, tries to make an emergency landing in New York's Hudson River after U U.S. Airways Flight 1549 strikes a flock of geese. Then we've got When the Bow Breaks, John and Laura Taylor desperately want to have a baby, so they hire Anna, a beautiful young woman who agrees to become a surrogate mother for the Taylors, and then develops a dangerous fixation with John. <laughs> I felt like I had to say it like that. All right, then up next is The Wildlife. Times are good for Mac the Parrot, Scrubby the Goat, and Carmelo the Chameleon until a mysterious creature washes up on shore. And lastly, The Disappointments Room. Dana, her husband, David, and their five-year-old son, Lucas, move to a stately old manor in the quiet countryside. After settling in, Dana starts to experience terrifying visions and dreams that she cannot explain. All right, Mark, which of these movies are you most looking forward to? Uh, the Disappearing Room sounds like a horror movie is going to scare me, but you got to get out of there. The wildlife not too into, even though the animals look cute. When the, when the bow breaks is something that I'm like, that could be a great guilty pleasure but Sully. It, it's Sully because I remember the miracle on the Hudson happening. I remember being so impressed with the bravery of uh, Chesley Sullenberger when he landed the plane on the Hudson. But I just wasn't aware as much of all of the controversial fallout or the flack I, that he got from the insurance companies afterwards who were investigating what actually happened, what he was going through in his mind as he made the decision to not try to turn back to LaGuardia and land the plane at the airport, that he, he thought his only course of action was to try to land it on the Hudson. So for that reason alone, and the fact that a lot of those things were filmed for IMAX, I think it's going to be worth seeing. Yeah, there's a couple of interesting ones here. For me, it's it's Sully. I've been fascinated by it ever since I saw the real life story and what actually happened. And the movie delivers. I have had an opportunity to see this film. I'm not going to go into a full review here, although you can see my review here on Collider Video. Just look down on our main page for that. You can see it there. But I was really impressed with the film. It's a very human drama. Mm -hmm. You're right. It goes into the stories that happened behind the story. And I thought on that level it worked really, really well. I also got to say, the Disappointments Room is one that I had not, it's not really been on my radar for the last few months. And I thought the trailer was really intriguing. For a low budget kind of psychological horror kind of film, it got me intrigued. So I am kind of looking forward to this one. Schnapp, what about you? Yeah, the Disappointments trailer to me was like, it just reminded me of the Lion, the Witch, and his wardrobe. But you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> get in the closet. I kept expecting Liam Neeson to start talking. Uh, yeah, for me, it's Sully. I can't wait to see that. I, I'm looking forward to seeing the 
after effects of the, the plane landing. Right, like, like what happens after it. I'm so glad that it's about that, it's similar to flight, but I hope they go into even more detail. Um, so that's what's exciting to me, to see like Tom Hanks actually give a real performance and to see what Clint Eastwood's going to offer as a director. The guy's the male Meryl Streep. I mean, every time, and it's yeah. always another example, every time he's on screen, especially in the fall, he is a threat to get an Oscar nomination. I think it could happen again. Sinead, if you could only pick one of these four films to see this week, which one are you going to go see? Well, I'm going to be real honest. I hadn't heard of any of these movies except for Sully. <laughs> um, and we've been talking about Sully a lot on Movie Talk as well. And th just the story and the content fascinates me so much. So obviously I have to give it to that. But I'm really surprised by the wildlife because I feel like where has the advertisement been? Zero. No, it's none. And I mean, they like literally started like last movie. week. And out of all of these, you would think that you would have heard the most about the wildlife. And the synopsis actually sounds pretty cute. It's animals and they meet a human yeah. who's obviously lost at sea and then washes up on shore. Even the, even the poster looks intriguing. It's so like a Robinson I'm, Crusoe kind of thing. And, and it does look like a cute movie. I'm not going to say it's Norma the North where it's like, let's right. just put a bunch of cute animals on a poster and see if anybody shows up. I hope wildlife is good. I'll probably check it out this weekend. Who's putting it out? What company? Uh, I know it's not Pixar. That's, well, you that's know, all I know. Sinead, you bring up a very interesting point. You know why none of us have heard of the wildlife? Name one star who's in it. Yeah, I have no idea. There's no names of there's any a, actors. There's a parrot. There's an elephant. But there's what I'm, a what I'm fox. saying is they're not going with the way that most traditional animated films do it now, which is to get the adults interested by actually hiring voiceover talent of who they know. Right. Like even Kubo has Charlize Theron and Matthew McConaughey. Imagine if they didn't have those names. It's just like Kubo and the two strings, and you just see a poster. It doesn't have that kind of ad campaign for the adults. The kids are all going to want to see this. None of us know what the hell it is. You don't think adults don't... want to see porcupines and lizards talk? Well, I don't know about them. Uh, maybe. But it know. is intriguing and unfortunate that with a lot of these things, like you expect to see trailers dropping longer than one week before. Right. Yeah. The, a week ago, a week before its release, was the first time I was really exposed to the film. And it's Studio Canal that's behind this project. And you just it makes me wonder. If you're only advertising it a week before, does the studio believe in this movie? Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I maybe that's not fair, but I can't help it. That is the first question that pops up in my head. That's, so that's the very first thing I think. I'm like, oh, I didn't see any trailers. That's because they're already not sure how this movie's going to do. That's the first thing I think of. Right, and maybe that's fair, maybe that's unfair, but it is the reality. All right, folks, listen, we do this show live every day, Monday through Friday, and that means a lot of you are watching us live as we speak, and if you are, we're going to save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take some of your questions via Twitter. So you can start sending in those questions now. Make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video, and start sending in your questions there. Wendy will be picking some of those out to address at the end of the show. I also want to remind you, since today is Thursday, for you Star Wars fans, that means it's Jedi Council Day, today being hosted by the one, the only, Mark Ellis. What? Mark, what, who do we have coming mm -hmm. up on Jedi oh, Council later? Oh, God, we well, got a very unprepared Mark, but I'll do my research. You also have Tiffany Smith and John Campia. You got a Mark Riley on set. It's going to be a fun show. There's a lot of good Star Wars news this week. All right, folks, we've reached a part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. we got a question pulled out right now, so Sinead, what do we got? Tattoo Dragon writes, I have always had a problem with this for a few reasons. If you are a celebrity, you are famous because of the fans. So showing your appreciation by giving back to those who have paid money to see your movie by giving a free autograph sounds like, at the very least, a thank you for making said person a Hollywood icon. Secondly, they are a freaking celebrity. They make millions of dollars per movie and I'm sure collect a royalty check for past performances. So it's very difficult for me to understand why a star would charge a fan $100 or more for a picture with a signature when they have already made more money on one film than I will make in several lifetimes. Mark, you hear uh, an email like this, and when we've talked about this off cameras before, you know, we go to a lot of festivals, we go to a lot of conventions, and usually at some of them there'll be a number of celebrities who will have lines, and usually, whether it's $10, $20, $5, $100, $100, you can get a picture and an autograph, whatever, but you gotta pay to be in that line. What's your reaction to that? How would you respond to this email? My reaction is if you charge $100 for an autograph, you're a jackass. If you make your fans get you a Coors Light before you take a picture with them, well, that's just fun at Comic-Con. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm of two minds on this because I think that sometimes it, it, it's, it's nice to make money 
and that you don't necessarily have to report to the government. You just get a hundred bucks, a hundred bucks here, a hundred bucks here. But it also helps like if you're somebody that's at a convention and you're going to get mobbed by fans for eight hours on end, there has to be some sort of price point in there just to for security reasons. Like if Mark Hamill's walking around a Star Wars convention, he's at a booth, it, there's going to need to be some sort of charge so everybody doesn't just run up to him at the same time and try to snap selfies with him. Now, the other end of that spectrum, though, is I believe what you're talking about. A lot of times it's people who just go to conventions and they're not in movies anymore. So I don't know what the contract for every actor in a movie looks like. I'm sure it's a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not not sure if Brigitte Nielsen still sees checks from Beverly Hills Cop 2 and Rocky 4, but when she rolls up to a convention, she might be cool with charging $100 because that might be a primary source of income for her and a lot of older stars now. You look at a guy like Tim Tebow, who charges $100 for an autograph or $180 for an autograph back because he's trying to play baseball now. It does make sense in a way because Tim Tebow's primary source of income for his entire livelihood was athletics. And if that's not going to be around for much longer, Longer in his life, you want to make cheddar while you can, while Tim Tebow autographing a bat is still going to be worth $180 because it might not be the case in 10 years. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing, but we as fans, we tend to have a very entitled mentality sometimes, and sometimes rightfully so, sometimes not. And we think, well, if that guy's a movie star, he owes us. And no, they don't owe you anything. They, 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 they really don't. They owe you politeness. They owe you common courtesy and stuff like that. But like, and we also have this, this vision in our heads as fans that if somebody was in a movie, they're rich millionaires. Mm -hmm. We all know at this table, people who have been famous at one point or another that just go paycheck to paycheck mm -hmm. today. I mean, that's just the reality. So for them to say, okay, I'm gonna take a weekend out of my time, fly out to some city and stuff like that, I don't find it's unreasonable for them to expect to make a little bit of money while they're going out doing it. Now, don't charge people $1,000 for you or whatever, but Mark brings up a great point. You put Mark Hamill at a desk, you're literally going to get 5,000 people lined up. They're never going to get to 5,000 people. you got to have some kind of barrier there to make it more manageable, whether it's charging 50 bucks or 100 bucks or, or what have you. But also keep this in mind, too. At some of these festivals and conventions, it's not, when you pay 50 bucks for an autograph, that doesn't necessarily go to the person signing the autograph. Sometimes these festivals and conventions hire, will pay a celebrity, let's, for argument's sake, let's say Tim Tebow, just mm -hmm. for argument's sake. They'll pay Tim Tebow, say, hey, will you come to our convention because it'll attract people to our convention? And he says, okay, I'll come for $10,000, I'll come and be at your convention. Now, then what that then happens then is that the convention will set up a $25 autograph thing and the convention gets to keep that. I'm not, that's not what normally happens, but that is a situation sometimes too. So me personally, I, I honestly have no problem with somebody charging for an autograph, you know, unless it's out in the street. You know, if somebody runs up to Schnepp outside here in downtown Burbank and says, Schnepp, can I get your autograph? And he says, give me 20 bucks. I'll smack him in the head. <laughs> but I mean, if, if it's at an official event exactly. and he's traveled out of town to go and be there, you know, probably cost himself a lot of money to pay for flights and hotels and all that kind of stuff. And the booth. You have to pay, you pay, you have to for, pay the for the booth that you're standing at. Yes. So you need to recoup those expenses. Yeah, I got no problem. Anyway, Schnepp, you go to an awful lot of these things. So you've seen free autographs yep. cheap autographs expensive autographs you've seen sometimes you know the it's the, the packages. conventions is playing yeah. the package deals what's your thought on this whole thing well it's funny i mean i'm glad we're addressing this i mean in the in your question you're assuming a quite a lot about celebrities like you know that they're making money and it's cool that people like still adore lou ferrigno but i don't think he's getting that many checks from his tv uh, incredible hulk days yet he's a he's at most conventions he charges you know between 25 to 40 bucks for a picture which he autographs he'll take photos with you that's his source of income at this point it's it's i think it's kind of wrong to assume just because you're a fan of somebody that they made their millions most people weren't that interested in mark hamill say six years ago when he was just doing the voice of the joker still people who loved the joker wanted his autograph but they weren't thinking of him as luke skywalker anymore once he came back as luke skywalker i just came from a convention where he's commanding 400 dollars per ticket for a, to see him in an auditorium. You get a signed autograph, like a, your choice of a picture that's signed by him and a photo with him. Now that package is put together because the company that flew him out for that day gave right. him a, a, a sum of money and then they put a package together where they can make money too. And so everybody kind of wins. If you're willing to put up 400 bucks, you get a picture of Luke Skywalker or him as the Joker. You get a photo with him and you see him in concert. Those are the kind of costs where people are like, that's outrageous. Yet some fans will pay that money. In fact, 
20,000 fans paid that money because the thing was sold out. So the, what happens is when, when you're hot, you're hot, and you want to get that money, that makes total sense. You shouldn't be mad at people, but and you also shouldn't be mad at, at actors or anybody who's been at conventions for like 20 years and they're asking for uh, some money because it does cost money. Like for me, usually I'll get flown out, I'll be put up at a hotel and be given a booth in exchange for me doing panels. I'll do like four or five panels from all the different aspects of my career as a writer or a director or a talk a host or anything like that. So it's giving back to the community that's there. I don't get any of the money that the actual convention charges, but I'm given this atten this uh, booth so that I can uh, sell some of my merchandise that I've made. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If people come to me with things that I've worked on, I'll sign autographs for that for free. I do selfies for free. I do a lot of stuff for free, but I'll have merchandise there that if they want me to sign it, that's what I'm selling. So I think there's a give and take with any kind of fan, but when you're talking about celebrities, you have to remember like, most people who do voiceover or in front of the camera, they don't make that much money. I just got an after check for 18 bucks. It's from something I did three <laughs> years ago. That's not paying for even lunch my lunch on today. Schnepp. I know, exactly. <laughs> we're going to, well, I guess we're going to McDonald's, you know? You can't even Each, buy a picture with Sinead for $18. Now. That's what I'm saying. So don't assume anything, really. Be happy that these people are giving up their weekend to come and see you at whatever convention they're at because they're sitting in a booth for like maybe three to four hours with no one there. I've seen a lot of people with no attendance. A lot of some of the doctors from the Doctor Who, like people just walk by them because they're not Tom Baker or they're not one of the more popular or you know younger doctors. People forget about them. So just remember that there's the trade-off in between all the things you're talking about. If people charge like 20 bucks for a photograph or whatever, it's up to you to decide whether you want to pay that money don't be mad at them and like and really too when you get those like if it's a mark ham or whatever you're getting something in return like i remember a couple years ago and my wife ann was a huge fan of vampire diaries she was a massive fan of vampire diaries right so she went to this convention in las vegas and she paid a hundred bucks to get to meet pose in a couple of pictures and get them to sign it the two lead guys from the vampire awesome. diaries and it's one of her prized possessions she loves that thing she has a great memory she had a great time doing it and she has that picture now and was that worth a hundred dollars for a lifetime of having those pictures and those memories and stuff like absolutely it was worth it to her so like look not, not everybody can afford a hundred dollars right. to go absolutely i totally get that but sometimes you can get both sides of the argument where it's unfortunate that one comes out short can i just add like i spent 80 bucks it was on a it was on a whim I saw Shatner at this convention in Atlantic That's City. That's so worth it. And I was like, yeah. I was just walking, and I was like taking a, a little mini break to go say hey to the comic book man from AMC. They were all hanging out. And I saw Shatner and his like his guards and stuff, and I walked up and I was like, yo, is there a giant line for Shatner? Because I'm about to put down 80 bucks. He was like, it's not a big line. It was kind of a big line. The guy lied to me, but it was totally worth it. And Shatner takes like a constipated face. He just sits there. <laughs> with every single person you, you show up and I was like yo man you want to do the horns he was like no I was like alright so I did the horns he did and he was like what does that mean I was like yo it's like that he's like alright cool left <laughs> totally worth it I love that picture with Shatner I don't know him never talked to him I don't want to address him I don't even want to be mad at me or anything it's cool to acknowledge him as Kirk that's 80 bucks well spent. That's how I look at it. And by all accounts, I mean, Shatner and Hamill are the kind of guys that would take a picture with you for free on the street. Like totally. we're talking about. Oh, but yeah, like if yeah. you're at a convention setting, that's a little bit different. Pete Rose, if you see him on the street, have $50 with you. <laughs> <laughs> if you see me on the street, I'll do a selfie. Yeah. That's it. I, so. I, ran, I, ran into, I ran into William Shatner once, right? It was at the Toronto, uh, it just happened recently, but I was at it like eight, nine years ago, the Toronto Fan Expo. If you've ever, never gone to the Toronto Fan Expo and you're in Canada, by all means, go to it. But I was getting ready to do something with uh, William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy. But I bumped into William Shatner in the hallway, and the first thing I thought to say was, man, you're awesome in Airplane too." Nice. <laughs> and he, he's like, I can honestly say, I have never bumped into somebody and have that be the first thing out of their mouth. That's <laughs> so, awesome. So it was, he was really fun about it. Hey, listen, guys, if you like hanging out with us here today, talking about movie news, maybe you want to hang out with us and watch Batman v Superman, the ultimate Yay. edition. <laughs> we record ourselves watching that. It's up online right now on our Collider YouTube channel. Make sure you go and check out our Batman Ultimate Edition commentary with uh, us three, Mr. Yeah. Mark Ellis, myself, and John Schnepp, sitting around and then uh, an appearance by Dennis Zen. Dennis at the came end. in at the end. He said, I was here the whole time. He wasn't. He wasn't. <laughs> he wasn't. He was around the twice. Not on camera. Look and see if you could catch Makuga like snaking in from the side. He's in there. <laughs> but if you're going to sit down and watch the Ultimate Edition anytime in the next couple of weeks, pop on your laptop and watch it along with us. It's an awful lot of fun. Well, that'll do it for us, guys, for this installment of Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting on my left, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? Just on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. 
Sitting over here to my right, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? Well, we got the Schmoes Note Live show tonight. We got Jedi Council coming up later today. And then tomorrow, it all goes down between me and Sam Levine. He's the inglorious one. They call me Baby Carrots. And look at that. I call that the chubby blue steel face I'm doing right there. <laughs> Cannot wait to get my hands on Levine. It's going to be a tough matchup. The guy's great at movie trivia. It airs tomorrow on Collider Video at 2 p.m. Sitting at the end of the table, Miss Manginello, Sinead DeFries. Sinead, where can people find you online? I'm online at Sinead DeFries and at thatsosinead.com. Here on Mondays, hosting Collider TV Talk. Um, usually on Fridays, hosting Movie Talk and hosting Mailbag over the weekends. Now, remember, I did say earlier in the show we were going to go some of your Twitter questions. We have unfortunately run a little bit over time, so don't worry. We'll have some extra time for Twitter questions tomorrow. I can say that because I'm not hosting the show and I don't have to carry <laughs> through on it. But I want to thank Wendy Lee, who's sitting back there anyway, who is manning the Twitter board. Hopefully you guys had a chance to interact with there. But Wendy, let everybody know anyway, where can people find you online? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And of course, you can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter simply at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.